the few who loved the book circled protectively about it, and critics said we were a cult, as if at midnight we gathered in abandoned barns to tear out pages of Hermann Wauk while chanting from the recognitions. Uh, especially loved lines like, Merry Christmas, the man threatened. <laughs> a sentiment which belongs alongside Ring Lardner's treasured, shut up, he explained. <laughs> there were bits of poetry also worth memorizing, but it was not true that we recited them in dark stalls. I remember particularly sweet Nora wine biscuit. Pride drew her garments up and swathed her face in lineaments incapable of disgrace slipped then away, her face bedewed with dew beyond the glass, and knowing all, she knew that the immortals have their ash cans too. So in the absence of the author, in the absence of the audience, we, the faithful, did create an icon and make the sudden appearance of this skull-busting, heartbreaking book, its sordid reception, the ensuing silence, into the emblematic cause celebre. Because what the recognitions proved was that great ambitions were still possible. They were not just instances of romantic futility. That the real, the original, the genuine work of art could be accomplished. That the novel was not dead, as many like to think, but had only taken a brief nap, a short snooze that the book's bleak outlook could be shared with something like a wry smile rather than the suicide, the seeminess of its worldview suggested. The novel's motto became our motto, no compromise. Gaddis didn't give an inch. And 20 years appeared to pass. We began to fear that solicitude was scarcely enough to sustain such a work forever. Then quite coincidentally, for coincidence is the real ruler of all things, I was asked to be a judge for the National Book Award during the very year in which J.R., William Gaddis's second novel, would appear. Mary McCarthy, also on the jury, simply shoved the third judge a worn-out hack reviewer, into the corner as you would an unnecessary chair, and the award went to Junior, as she liked to call it. This did not mean the war was won. The war against mediocrity is never-ending. Mediocrity is like the salt mill of fable. It keeps on turning, and a sea of brains goes brackish. George Steiner pronounced J.R. unreadable, and Alfred Kazin bless his bourgeois heart, wrote that it was like nothing else around and is not a masterpiece. Well, he was half right. It was like nothing else around. J.R. is about that great depersonalizer, money, and is written in speech scraps, confetti-like wiggles of brightly colored cliché. As a medium, it would appear to be as unpromising as might be imagined and the reader has to ride in the parade and organize all that's fluttering, that fluttering that's come down from on high. J.R. takes time, J.R. takes patience, J.R. takes work, J.R. takes faith. But unlike other faiths, it does not put off salvation until some weekend after all who have lived are dead and only their bones dance. It is immediately and continuously rewarding. Now let me give you a small sample. Two men drinking something called liquor deluxe are discussing the division of property in the process of a divorce, and the rather fanatical sense of fairness of the wife comes up for comment. The person David mentioned in the passage is the couple's kid. So damn fair she believes it. Took Kurt Weil left me Mahler, took the top half of the double boiler, left me the bottom half. So goddamn fair, she's doing it for my sake. What about David's sake? How many damn times I've told her we could hold things together for David's sake? Goddamn worst thing you could have told her. 
Goddamn mother in Solomon's ready to cut the kid in half, give you the bottom half, time like that. Worst goddamn thing you could tell her, time like that. Starring in her own soap opera, worst goddamn thing you could tell her. Well, goddamn it, she let her go star in her own damn soap opera. Is that any reason she had to drag David away from every damn thing he ever... Point is, whole goddamn point is, she wants to be taken seriously, needs a supporting cast, talented woman, never been allowed to do anything, sit here all day drinking Mr. Clean, works up a whole goddamn drama, has a part for everybody, Arabs, Israeli, Irish, same goddamn thing, scared maybe. Nobody takes them seriously. Goddamn Irish, no. Everybody knows they're a goddamn joke, so the worse they get. Goddamn self-righteous Israelis leave the Arabs the bottom half, uh, take the top half of the double boiler, uh, leave the Arabs the bottom half. Everybody's so goddamn sick of all of them. All they do is run around shouting for an audience somewhere to take them seriously. Same goddamn thing. Fill this up. A uh, whole goddamn problem. Tastes like apricots. Whole goddamn problem. Listen, whole goddamn problem. Read Wiener on communication. More complicated the message. More goddamn chance for errors. Take a few years of marriage. Such a goddamn complex of messages going both ways. Can't get a goddamn thing across. Goddamn much entropy going on. Say good morning. She's got a goddamn headache. Thinks you don't give a goddamn how she feels. Ask her how she feels. She thinks you just want to get laid. Try that. She says it's the only goddamn thing you take seriously about her. Puts you out of business and goes running around like the goddamn Israelis waving the top half of the double boiler. Have to tell everybody they're right. Goddamn Arabs mad as hell sitting there with the bottom half. Pretend you take them seriously. Only thing you want is their goddamned oil. The music, the arrangement of the rant, the repetitive army style cursing, the way the words run together so the reader has to take the text in hand and sort it out, the sly manner in which the crucial clue, the reference to cybernetics and Norberg Wiener is slipped in, the leap from marriage to Middle East and back again, the kitchen appliance revision of Solomon's solution. These elements interact at another level, the level which defines the movement of an impatient, helpless, and exasperated mind, and underscore the message. Nearly everything is damned, although the expression, God damned, when Gaddis gets done with it, may be a bit more lively and less hackneyed than before. As time goes by, the mysterious Mr. Gaddis is actually seen in public, is elected to the academy, earns a MacArthur, writes a book in less than 20 years. He must be slipping. <laughs> Carpenter's Gothic, the briefer, more accessible model novel, breaks the cult's hold on his appreciation and gives him a larger audience. This is certainly true in Europe, especially in Germany, where Carpenter's Gothic has been acclaimed. Reviewers read no better than they ever did, but they are respectful now. They are terrified of making fools of themselves which is an improvement. This year, when a frolic of his own appeared, and after the Lannan Foundation awarded William Gaddis their Lifetime Achievement Award, those earlier works quietly became classics, as if they had never been thunderclaps, as if they had always been applauded, as if his artistry, his stature, had never been in doubt, as if he had never exposed America as the land of the fraudulently free as he was doing once again, this land of the litigatious, or of the sewer and the sui, in a depiction so farcically funny, so absurdly interconnected, so bottomlessly baroque, that it reads like a tabloid or a New York Times that's come apart in the rain. First, there's a kid whose cur has been caught in a piece of convoluted public sculpture, and he's suing on behalf of the dog. Then there's the sculptor who is getting an injunction to prevent his work from being dismantled in order to extricate the mutt. Next there's the city which wants both arf and art out of its park. The Episcopal Church is suing PepsiCo for marketing a soft drink, Pepsi-Cola, under an anagram of their name. And there's Oscar Kreese who has two suits going, one a laurel, the other a hardy. 
He claims that Hollywood has stolen his play about the Civil War, once at Antietam, and made it into a blockbuster pornogore movie, The Blood in the Red, White, and Blue. The unfortunate Crease has also run over himself trying to hotwire his car. The Otto is a Japanese model called Sosumi. <laughs> he intends to take the owner of the car to court. Given their material and each book's point, these novels ought to be gloomy and sour, but they manage to achieve quite the opposite effect. I have found myself momentarily happy that man is such a mean and selfish small-time hustler because he thereby furnishes William Gaddis such a satisfying target.